Unfortunately, folks, we have to talk about some economic policy that, if enacted, could quite frankly destroy the U.S. economy and leave America a shell of its former self. This is no joking matter. Uh, I don't believe, I don't, I certainly don't hope uh, that these policies go into effect. But if you remember, two years ago, when CPI was 9.1%, I created some content and some videos around possible reactions by the government. And we had long conversations about the 1970s. And we talked about price controls. We talked about Jimmy Carter and his win buttons. Yes, folks, they had buttons that said win. What did win stand for? Whip inflation now. Now, folks, if you were not alive in the 70s or not old enough to remember it, let me remind you, it was a horrible period. One of the things that Jimmy Carter did is he set price controls on gasoline. If you don't remember, do yourself a favor and search gas lines of the 1970s. Folks, I am not kidding you. They alternated when you could fill up your car. If your license plate ended in an even number, you could go on one day. If it was an odd number, you could go on a different day. Folks, Russia, Venezuela, many other countries have tried price controls, and the outcome is always the same. It might feel good in the moment, but very quickly, supply reduces. Next, quality reduces. Next, you will start to see a black market for goods. And then, folks, you start to see bread lines, gas lines. Price controls, again, might feel good, might whip up excitement, but if you remove the competitive juices, you are left with pain, suffering, and misery. The fact that someone would think grocery stores have been gouging people when the average grocery store's margin is under 2% is somewhere between comical and insulting. It's, it is more expensive at the grocery store. You and I both know it. We have a politician that is trying to whip up that energy and blame the grocery stores for price gouging. Folks, you can look at their income statements <laughs> and realize that most grocery stores profits are down because they've had to implement other systems and processes uh, that the government mandated. So hopefully we don't go back to repeating mistakes of uh, Russia, Venezuela, Jimmy Carter. But I think we are seeing economic policy that should be frightening. We are seeing economic policy position right now that should be frightening. It, it's, I have never met an economist who thought price controls was the right answer. It's, it's like O oh, in a hundred. It doesn't work. It might feel good, but it simply doesn't work. All right, that's enough about price controls, groceries, all of that. Let's talk about the big elephant in the room. We got some housing policy released. I think it was on Friday. It might have been Saturday uh, that we need to talk about. Uh, we have some ho housing policy that is net well, let's go through it in general. Actually, I took some notes. I'm going to pull up on my phone real quick because I want to make sure I get them. And just so you know, at noon today, noon today, you're going to get a special treat from Lance Lambert. Lance Lambert and I had an emergency call yesterday morning breaking down uh, Kamala's um, housing policy. Uh, you can go ahead and find Lance's article on Fast Company. So there are basically four points that I want to talk about. And we're going to end with the $25,000. Uh, number four, we'll go backwards. Creating a $40 billion innovation fund that would empower local governments to fund local solutions to build housing. <coughs> I think there's a lot of goodness in that, in that statement. I believe 
if the government is going to get involved in housing, it has to be at the local level. I am not one to believe that the federal government has the power, know-how, skill, experience to institute housing at the local level. So I believe any focus at the local level is net positive. It is a good idea. I think it is a good idea. Number two, or number three, I'm sorry, I'm going backwards. Expansion of the existing tax incentives for builders that build rental housing that is affordable. Again, I think if you are taking existing tax incentives and you are increasing or encouraging or whatever, whatever that is, I think, again, that is net positive. You are basically empowering individuals and companies that are already doing that work to do more of that work. Again, I think that is net positive. Number two, going backwards, creating a tax incentive to encourage builders to build starter homes. It would complement the neighborhood homes tax credit. I honestly don't know what that tax credit is. I'm going to assume it's easy to, I don't know, marry up or partner. Again, I think setting tax incentives to empower Builders who are already doing that to build what we need, affordable housing, entry-level housing, again, net positive. So before we get to the $25,000, I want to bring another surprising elephant in the room that I don't think anybody except Lance Lambert is talking about. And that is the goal of building 3 million new homes. Now, when you first hear that we are gonna build three million new homes, you, I, say bravo. Bravo, we finally have a politician talking about supply. You have heard me for years whine, complain, yes, maybe bitch, about demand. Nobody talking about supply. So I wanna give credit where credit is due. We are talking about three million new units. Now, folks, unfortunately, unfortunately, as an economist, I need to remind you what that means. Because the unintended consequences is not good. Again, it feels good. It's the right answer. But you got to remember, when you are building 3 million homes, 750,000 homes a year. Let's talk about that. Seven. 150,000 homes a year. That is roughly 25 to 30% more homes that are being built right now. Okay. How, Michael, how can that be a bad thing? Well, again, I didn't say it was a bad thing. I just want you to know what happens next. Okay. This is what happens. All right. So you have, you out of somewhere, you now create more supply. That means more lumber, more windows, more concrete, more copper, more this, more that, more this, more that, more this, more that. What did we learn during the pandemic? Folks, I will ask you to go look at your lumber charts. Folks, back in 2020, the uneducated economist warned us that lumber was going to shoot through the roof, and he was right. What was really happening, though? Well, builders, builders seeing the demand from the public ramped up production. That ramp up in production did it into a supply chain that did not have enough capacity. See folks, we run in a supply chain with very, very little slack. The slack is often maintenance schedules, you know, an old assembly line. It's not efficient. So if you suddenly add 30% more production, you are going to get nasty inflation. Lumber will go up, concrete will go up, windows will go up, washers and dryers, everything will get more expensive. And then, oh my God, oh my God, labor. If you've seen anything in the construction industry, we have a uh, labor shortage. We have a skill gap. 
So if you suddenly unleash the building of 750,000 new homes for a year, you better believe labor is going to get more expensive. And oh, by the way, the labor is going to come from the margins. So if you wanted to do any fix and flips or remodeling, you're going to pay more too. <laughs> yeah. So again, it is the right idea, but you have to look at the entire supply chain. Where is this lumber going to come from? Where are these windows going to come from that go into these 750,000 new homes you want to build a year? Okay, now we can go to the 25,000 bucks, which again, I don't know if you caught this, and Lance Lambert, again, is the only person that caught this that I know of. It was, it was pitched that the down payment assistance would average, average 25,000. Hey, Brian, thanks for buying your VIP ticket to the event. Um, we will see you in Vegas. So again, down payment assistant will average 25,000. So what does that mean? Well, that means some folks are going to get a lot more money. And again, folks, $25,000 on an entry level house could be somewhere between, I don't know, four and 20% of the purchase. Now, we don't have any rules or guidelines to this, but it's definitely first-time buyer-oriented, uh, probably first in your family, I would guess, some qualities like that. But if you unleash a $25,000 down payment in free money, again, all you have to do is go back to the pandemic to understand what free money does. Folks, the American consumer does not respect free. They just piss it away. And if you're going to give them $25,000 in free money, you better believe we are going to unleash a gargantuan level of uh, demand. And oh, by the way, folks, where's the supply? Where's the supply? Do you think the supply is going to be in these 750,000 homes that are going to be built? I have news for you. It's not. It's lit. The problem with this is something called elasticity and inelastic. Yes, these are economic terms. I'm sorry to bore you, but these are important. Elastic means how fast something could change. Inelastic means how sticky or hard it is to change. So I ask you, in this scenario that we've just talked about, more supply and more demand, which is inelastic and elastic? Well, folks, we already learned that answer. We have learned, we have been here before. Demand is very elastic. It will snap instantaneously. Folks, go look at the active listings. See how low the active listings got? That was because demand just came out of nowhere. And we had bidding wars and acceleration clauses and waiving inspections and stupidity and stupidity and stupidity. The supply, even with best efforts and a magical supply chain that somehow works itself out, what, 18 months, 24 months, shoot, four years away? I remind you, again, whenever the government gets involved, they make promises that they suck at keeping. In the last four years, I believe there are two examples that you could look at and go, you're not going to fool me this time. I ask you to look at the notion of broadband to rural America. I believe that was approved three or four years ago. I believe it was 40, 50, 100 billion dollars. And not one home has been connected. Okay, great. That's one example. How about another one? Well, billions of dollars were deployed to put EV charging stations, charging stations across the country. Supposed to be thousands and thousands and thousands of them. Based on an article I read yesterday, they have successfully done eight. So again, I ask you, if demand is elastic and supply is inelastic, can anything come from this except wildly inflationary? Folks, we would I, I estimate that within 12 to 18 months, entry-level housing would go up 10 to 15%. We've been here before. You can look at the charts. It's not that hard. 
And oh, by the way, if you unleash this demand into a falling rate environment, buckle up, buckle up. So again, I want to remind what I said at the beginning. I think it is a wonderful idea to talk about supply. I think anything you could do at the local level, anything you could do with tax incentives to get the behavior you want is a good idea. But those ideas take time to work through. Unleashing demand, which is hugely elastic, <laughs> is inflationary. And if you do that into also price caps and price controls, we could destroy the economy. We could have bread lines. We could go back to the 70s and have lines. of You could, you could only fill up your tank on Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. Other people, Thursday, Tuesday, Thursday, and Saturday. We have done that before. Jimmy Carter in his whip inflation now buttons did it. Price controls feel good, but don't end well. Alrighty, folks, we got a couple other things to talk about. Sorry for that little rant, but I figured we have to go through the economics of these proposals. Uh, we got some important data coming this week. Monday, U.S. leading economic indicators. Is the U.S. heading to a recession or not? We got a couple of Fed speeches on Tuesday. We will get the FMOC minutes on Wednesday. I'm going to be curious how much of a uh, talk was there around a cut. Thursday, we will get initial jobless claims. Again, are we trending in the 230s? Or are we going back to the 240s on the weekly numbers? We will get existing home sales. Folks, this is the one. I think this is the one. Remember, it was about six or eight weeks ago. I said that we are going to go below the bottom of 3.88 million. Last month, we got close. We got close. 3.89 million. The experts are calling for 3.95. Again, I am calling for sub 3.88. So I think we are going lower. And then Friday, we get the Jackson Hole speech from Jerome Powell. This will undoubtedly be market moving. Will he talk about the certainty of a September rate cut? Will he put it on pause and make it a 50-50 chance? Will he talk about waiting till after the election? I don't know, but it is going to be interesting. Folks, uh, we have an accountability group today. Sunday, we have an accountability group. Uh, if you are in the school community, Jared and team will be running that. If, again, uh, if you need some help, you want to be in different rooms with investors really doing it, join school. Also, I want to let you know the Vegas event starting to fill up. I'm starting to create the outline. Uh, I have a, I'm releasing a video tomorrow, perhaps the most important discussion I've had ever uh, with a young man named Fred. Uh, that, that, uh, that's going to be a powerful session in, uh, in Vegas. Uh, I'll just leave it at that and I'll let that video speak for itself. Uh, we're going to, we're going to, you know, you're going to be in a room with a bunch of go-givers. You're going to have a ton of fun. You're going to get your questions answered. More importantly, you're going to get your answers or questions answered from more than one person. Uh, you're going to be in a, you're going to see a diverse group of speakers, real estate, content, mental health, stocks, relationships, etc. cetera. Uh, you're going to hopefully create new friends and important memories. And of course, you're going to learn, be inspired, and frankly, motivated to do the work. Uh, again, join the school community. We are going to have some special guests hosting sessions. You got Casey from Brick by Brick tomorrow. She's doing uh, a couple of Mondays. You got Dion and Matt doing some stuff on Friday. You have uh, Frank leading accountability groups on Wednesdays and Jared on Sundays. Uh, Ty's doing an event uh, later in the week. Matt, the mortgage guy's doing one later in the week. Uh, folks, why aren't you a part of school? You have to be in rooms with people that are doing the things that you want to do. If you are in school and haven't introduced yourself, please do. There are so many amazing people in there. Just tell me what your buy box is. Ask questions. Tell your journey. Tell your story. I promise you, you will see the love. Alrighty, folks. Take care of yourself. Oh, scary, scary times. Oh, I can't believe we're talking about price controls. Oh, my God. Later.